So we have the vehicle speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake, the landing zone is the Bahamas. Should be enough to figure the go, no go? Yeah, in theory, sir. We need to be past theory at this point. We'll be able to calculate a go, no go with that information. When exactly is that going to happen? Catherine? For re-entry is 2,990 miles from where we want Colonel Glenn to land. If we assume that's the Bahamas, 544 miles per hour of 46.56 degrees, 2,990 miles. Okay, so that puts your landing zone at 5.0667 degrees north, 77.3333 degrees west, which is here. Give or take 20 square miles. I like your numbers. Hello, and welcome to another episode of ERG Power Talk. I'm your host, Joe Santana. That clip you just heard is from the 2017 hit movie Hidden Figures, which is about African-American women at NASA in the 1960s who, despite facing adversity, leverage their talents and intellect to make significant contributions to the space program. And just like back then in the 1960s, many organizations today continue to underutilize hidden talent, especially those who volunteer their time and energy to lead and drive value through resource groups. Here's what I mean. I recently researched what organizations want resource groups to do, and the list of items at the top was this. Fostering a feeling of inclusion by providing a platform for employees from diverse backgrounds to come together and share their experiences. Enhancing employees' feelings of engagement by offering underrepresented employees the opportunity for personal and professional development, mentoring, and networking. Attracting and retaining women and minorities by making the company seem more attractive. Helping employees who might otherwise feel isolated due to their background or identity feel like they belong. Supporting HR legal compliance by helping the company create evidence of a proactive effort to comply with laws and regulations to mitigate legal risks and help protect the company's reputation. And providing employees facing specific challenges related to their identity or background with support in coping. Now, here's the problem with these statements. They essentially focus only on using the members of these groups as a crutch to make the existing company as is more appealing and more engaging to underrepresented people without fully leveraging them to improve the organization's practices and policies and approach to enable them to better engage the emerging workforce and marketplace. And that is the equivalent of having a brilliant African-American female mathematician sitting in a cubicle away from the meeting where decisions require her mathematical expertise. So how can you escape this limiting trap as an ERG leader? What are some of the opportunities to have a more significant impact? Where are today's opportunities for you as Hidden Figures to step up? To answer those and other questions, we have the perfect guest. But before we introduce our guest, let's take a moment to review our mission and acknowledge our supporters. This is ERG Power Talk, and I'm your host, Joe Santana. ERG Power Talk is your 21st century virtual forum for the exchange of great ideas and inspiration for ERG leaders, as well as others interested in supporting ERGs. With ERG Power Talk, there is no more waiting until the next conference and praying that you get the budget to travel to the conference to find great ideas and stimulation. Just subscribe and listen to thought leaders at your convenience. Before we begin, a quick note of thanks to our supporters. Elastic, Dollar General, Freighter Health and Wisconsin Medical College, Hiscox, Mass Mutual, Manpower Group, Tapestry, Federal Reserve System, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, Oshkosh Corporation, UL Solutions, and Sony Pictures Entertainment. Now, let's go straight to the program. 
She is an internationally recognized speaker, author, and advisor who has contributed to leadership and diversity for over 20 years. For 16 of those years, she was managing director and senior advisor for global leadership and diversity for Goldman Sachs. She's also been the director of the Women's Leadership Project, co-founder of the White House Project dedicated to electing a woman president of the United States and work with presidents and prime ministers from around the globe. Thanks so much, Joe. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our hour together and the participation of the people who are listening right now on this conversation. Yes, as you indicated, I've had some uh, long-term experience uh, uh, in uh, the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, also with women's leadership. Um, you know, so sometimes people ask me, you know, kind of how did I get into onto this path? Well, you know, I, I am a lawyer uh, and have been involved with uh, civil rights issues, et cetera. But I'll tell you where it really hit me, Joe. Uh, when I was, uh, I had gone around the world, met all the living women presidents and prime ministers to, think, to find out about what it would take to have a woman president in the United States and what it would be like. And we ended up, uh, I did meet all of them. We ended up creating a council of these world leaders we put them at the Kennedy School at Harvard for a while, the secretariat. And every day I would walk past the John F. Kennedy Park where there's a engraving in granite, the quote from John F. Kennedy. And it said, when at some future date, the high court of history sits in judgment on each one of us, our success or failure in whatever office we hold will be measured by the answers to four questions. Will we truly measure courage? Were we truly men of dedication? Were we truly men of integrity? Were we truly men of judgment? And I'd read that every day. And you know, I'd, I'd think to myself, oof, such good questions to ask men. But they're terrific questions to ask women too, right? Because, you know, <laughs> uh, there, there's no boundary on leadership. There's no gender, if you will, on leadership. If you think about the traits of Anyone. And when I say leader, I don't just mean the president or prime minister. I mean, every one of us has a leader with them, right? Those traits are not gendered traits. You know, trust and knowledge and ability to speak your own ideas and fairness and humility and all the curiosity and listening skills and all of those kinds of things. And Howard Gardner, in his book on, uh, on leadership, talked about four major traits of leaders. Um, and he said the first one was that they had a true north. That is, they had a, you know, a sense of values. Okay, we can all have those. Second, he said they were willing to challenge authority. Well, that can happen from anyone, right? Third, he said they just basically had the skill sets to articulate their ideas. They were able to communicate their ideas. And fourth, he said, and this is one I think quite relevant to our conversations we go forward. Fourth, he said they had traveled. And what he meant was not travel to uh, uh, Zimbabwe, interesting as that might be. What he meant was traveled outside of your world view. Now that turns out to be a lot harder, particularly for dominant groups. You know, those men sitting around that table in the clip you just showed, they probably had very little understanding, appreciation, awareness of this black woman who clearly was head and shoulders above almost all of them. But they didn't have very much awareness of her. Now, she had a lot of awareness of them, you know, because she had to have traveled outside of her worldview, but they didn't travel outside of their own worldview. And therefore, you see those kinds of limitations that you that, that the movie showed and that you articulated. That is a fantastic opening to our discussion, Laura. So welcome to ERG Power Talk. I'm eager to have this conversation with you. So happy that we've kicked it off this way. A lot of organizations think that by having representation that they solve their DEI problems. But you call this sort of the Noah's Ark approach, two of each. And you're basically saying, hey, that's not enough. Can you tell us why and what else is needed? Yeah, that's, um, I do call it the Noah's approach, Noah's Ark approach, which is, you know, God, if we can only just get two of each in the Ark, 
you know, we'll have our diversity and people mistake um, that the re that representation is the end goal. Well, no, it's not. Uh, one of the challenges with that is that I use a lot of animal examples. Um, you know, if the giraffe looks at the zebra in the ark and says, Oof, you're funny looking. How do you do anything with that stupid short neck of yours? You know, if, if you know, if we are doing that in the ark, which we are, we actually never get what we say we want from this diversity representation. Because don't forget, now there's this D, E, and I, and some other, there are some other initials that people are adding to that, but that's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Or as some people are now calling it diversity, opportunity, and inclusion. But those other words are very important. The inclusion part of it is very important. You know, the opportunity, the equity. Because if you just get that representation, you know, you, you're not really actually going to get what you said you want from diversity, you know, and diversity is basically cognitive diversity, different experiences, the different knowledge, different ways people look at problems, but that only comes with far more sophisticated approaches to it than just representation, you know, because a lot of companies often get pretty good at intake into the company, particularly at the lower levels within the organization but they have a really hard time with upgrade, getting them beyond that entry level and getting them to stay. Now, ERGs play a role in that, obviously, as you indicated, and we can talk more about that. But, he, but we really have to look at, you know, we have to look at, for example, the gaps in how people perceive the organization where, as a meritocracy, for example. You know, I've never met anyone at the top of an organization who said, I got to the top of this organization because I was subtly advantaged. Who says that? <laughs> Nobody says that. <laughs> I got to the top of this organization because it's fair and it's, you know, only the best get to the top and we all have the same opportunities, which of course is not even close to true. You know, from all the research and everything we know. And, and one of the I think one of the extremely important values of an ERG is to be that mirror of what, you know, lived experiences are in organizations. And I think leaders have an obligation to understand what those gaps are between those who think it's a meritocracy and those who don't think it's a meritocracy and then focus on why that is. Yeah. One of the things that I noted in that little list that I put together where it talks about helping the organization to look good is one of the things that the ERGs do is that in some organizations, it's literally, rather than what you just said right now, which I think is the smart thing to do, let's use these different communities as a mirror to better understand what we can do better and how we can be more effective in supporting the success of women and other people in the organization. Instead, they are often used as a, let's all celebrate how wonderful we already are. And that's why we don't have to change anything because we're already so wonderful in the meritocracy, right? And I, whenever I see this, I say to myself, it kind of defeats the purpose of that value that you get when you utilize these groups to do more of that reflection and to look and to learn and to listen to them and find out how can we support these other communities that are coming in that aren't the same as the ones that existed back in the mid-1900s when we put a lot of our policies and practices together. So I love that. You know, I love the title of your book, and I heard you talk a little bit about where that title came from, the story behind it. I'd love for you to share that story because that story also tells us something about how we interact with each other as groups and probably some of the challenges that organizations and individuals face when we bring together people who come from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, as we were saying earlier. Absolutely. Uh, I, I assume I have, I have two books now with this one, the first one being The Loudest Duck, which yes. I assume that's the one you're, you're thinking of because I have a, a new one out just came out a bit ago called The Elephant and the Mouse. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit first about the loudest duck, because, you know, a lot of organizations say they want diversity. You know, you ask them, they say, absolutely, they're supporting of it. 
uh, and you know the problem with it is is that uh, some research that shows that you know homogeneous groups don't come to better solutions they just think they did and heterogeneous groups come to better solutions they just don't think they did mm. because it turns out that you know heterogeneity, heterogeneity is far harder takes differing leadership skills. It takes differing processes put into place. It takes differing data collection and differing metrics than what most organizations have historically had or how they've historically held people accountable. So, you know, you're really looking at some major issues. Now, the loudest duck comes from the, the notion that, yes, we bring all these differing people in, but we're not necessarily aware of how it is that they, they bring themselves to the workplace. Now, I call that grandma. What if, when we bring our grandma to work with us, now that's not our grandmothers, that's more like society and culture and what we were raised to, to understand and learn and what, you know, what we are considered good things to do and what can, are considered bad things to do within your own culture. Uh, so basically the way I, I frame it is that a lot of people, particularly Americans, particularly men in America, not always just men, um, are taught that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Speak up, you get what you want. Fine, that is a cultural norm. Fine. But if you go to Japan, for example, and I know this, no one knows what that means. No one. Why? Because in their culture, they're taught the nail that sticks out gets hit on the head, which is about 180 degrees opposite the squeaky wheel. And women, and some of the women in the listening will recognize this, you know, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And the Chinese are taught the loudest duck gets shot. So, <laughs> so then I say to people, you know, I say, okay, Joe, you're the manager in this meeting and you said you wanted diversity. So I'm giving you diversity. You got a wheel, a duck, a nail, and an ice sitting in your room in your meeting because you wanted diversity. So now you got it. All right. The only person talking is the wheel. Because that's what they're taught. Speak up. You get what you want. Right? So you're overhearing the wheel. You're underhearing the nail, duck, nice. You're getting the ideas of the wheel, but you're not getting the ideas of the nail duck nice, right? And then for some managers, they've got a promotion to give or a good assignment to give, and they're kind of unaware of their, what's the impact of this diversity, and they're going, wheel, gosh, they have good ideas. Wheel, mm, really interesting things they've got to say. Oh, I've got a promotion to give. I'll give it to the wheel, right? And the nail duck nice, seriously disadvantaged. And you said you wanted cognitive diversity and differing perspectives, and you didn't get it. So that's how I came to this. And so it turns out you actually need some tools to make sure that you have a level playing field, to make sure that not, some people are not overheard and some people are not underheard. You know, and the, they're, they're, they're not rocket science tools, incidentally. <laughs> they're pretty easy tools, you know, inviting people to speak. Being what, because I was once a police officer, being a traffic cop, you know, making sure you go, okay, hold on, wheel, let's hear from Nail, let's hear from Doc, you know, let's hear from, you know, uh, nice, hold on, you know, hold on, and making it, making it so that everyone is invited to speak. Because some people have been taught by grandma, do not speak unless invited to speak. Yeah. And some people have also been taught by grandma, do not speak unless it comes out perfectly. You've got some cultures who have that. Okay, so again, simple tool. I say to you, Joe, because that's your cultural norm. Joe, I'm going to call on you in this meeting tomorrow. You think, you prepare, you speak. It's simple, but people don't do it. And so then you get this really disadvantage, advantage stuff going on, and you didn't get what you said you wanted from the diversity. The, the newest book is called The Elephant and the Mouse, and interestingly, you hit it on the head with that because the subtitle of that one is moving beyond the illusion of inclusion. Yeah, now, yeah. Illusion of inclusion is not 
original to me, that's a woman named Cheryl Kaiser who came up, penned that name. But what she meant in that research was companies do a lot of activities and the ERGs do a lot of events. You know, you got the wine tasting and you got the speaker series and you got the book clubs and all of these kinds of events, right? And the organization maybe has some hiring practices that they do, or they have some mentoring programs that they put into place, you know. All of this gives people the illusion that they're actually doing inclusion in the or in the organization. And then people go away saying, well, yeah, we're, we're really good at this. We, you know, we got a great diversity effort. We got all these ERGs doing all this stuff. You know, we got the, we're recruiting at some schools, et cetera, you know, and it's just an illusion. Mm. But people think, oh, we're doing a lot here. We're doing a lot, but mm -hmm. it's actually not making the needle move. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go back to your second book in, in a short while, but I wanted to go back to that first piece that you were talking about. And it's so true because you always, you find that in so many groups where you have some people because of their orientation, they overshare. And then you have mm -hmm. other people because of their orientation who basically will sit there unless you call them out directly, they won't jump in. And if you don't give them some kind of advance warning that you're going to call them out, they get kind of flustered. And it's not because they're not smart or because they're not sharp or ready. It's just that they're not used to that cultural way of communicating that many people are in places like North America and certain parts of Europe. And I facilitated tons of meetings in different countries with leaders. And a lot of times when I was going around the room, depending on the culture, there were certain people, men, who <laughs> I would call on them for a comment. And they would give their comment. Then I would call the next man and he would give his comment. Then I would call a woman. And while she was talking, one of these other guys would stop, start talking at the same time, literally adding to her comment or talking over her. And I found that as the facilitator of that discussion, a lot of times I had to turn around and say, hold your thought. We listen to you. Now we listen to her. And then after we finish listening to everyone, if you still have an extra thought to add, we'll come back to you, right? And I, I literally had to be, to your point, like a traffic cop in order to prevent that from happening. But it tended to happen within certain groups where there was a certain power dynamic. In some places, it was women and men. In other places, it was people who considered themselves to be of a higher caste than someone else. And, and so it was always, there was always that power dynamic of who felt it was okay for them to interrupt the other person and, or who felt that they are, their ideas actually should take more prominence and should be the ones really heard. And they had a comment for every comment. So it was really an, an interesting dynamic that you bring up. And you started to talk about the tools that uh, people can use who are leaders in, you know, in these teams that are diverse. And by the way, these people who manage and who lead employee resource groups, they're leaders too. And there's diversity within those groups because even though you have, let's say, a group of women or you have a group of African-Americans or let's just make it more general, you have a group of people that are black, they may come from different backgrounds too. I mean, if you were born and raised in Jamaica, you're not exactly the same as someone who grew up in, let's say, New York City or North Carolina or someone who grew up in some other locations. So uh, even within these groups that are focused on some social element of identity that's shared by everyone, there is there's diversity. So I think this is advice that's not only good for the leader of a group, a team, let's say an accounting team or a marketing team, but even for a person who's a leader of an ERG. So with that, then I'd love for you to talk a little more about what some of those tools are. You already started talking about one, that with certain people, it's good to give them a heads up. Hey, I'm going to call you at this meeting. That gives them that prep time that they need so that they feel like they're listening to grandma's advice. Don't talk unless you've got it right in your head. I'd love to hear your advice for the person who might be a little more reserved. What are some other things, Laura, that you guys that leaders do? You know, we can certainly talk, to, you know, at length about various kinds of tools uh, and what those kinds of tools look like. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that what you're saying is not, this isn't just gender specific. This isn't just, you know, race specific or anything like that. It's about, 
And why I use these phrases, dominant groups versus non-dominant groups, because that's what you're talking about. That's the dynamic you're talking about. You know, now you just happen, you can overlay gender onto that. You can overlay any particular category onto that, but it's who is the dominant group in the organization or in that particular sector or whatever, and who are the non-dominant groups? So I like to use those terminology because for example, you know, dominant groups are assumed to be competent until they show they're incompetent. And non-dominant groups are assumed to be incompetent until they prove they're competent. Yeah, that's kind of a overarching sort of theme. And you see this with organizations, you know, that's called the prove it again bias, you know, the prove it again bias. You have to constantly prove yourself over and over again. And it, it, your, your achievements never collect, you know, for you. You have to do it every time or you've got, you know, in the United States, although it applies to other countries, you've got sort of the what I call the Jackie Robinson phenomenon, you know, which is OK, you can join our team different as you are and we don't really like you, but you can join the team if you hit it out of the ballpark every time, every time. Yeah. So it's like in even the clip that you showed us, she just hit it out of the ballpark, right? before they all get, oh, maybe she does have something to say, you know, far superior to what someone else might have been able to do. But she has that standard by which she is measured. Now, some of the ways you can overcome that, you know, you've got this sort of the, the human dynamics, like the traffic cop kind of thing, you know, and, and, and being aware. So, for example, even in a meeting that we're talking about with this traffic cop, we also know that the first person who speaks in a meeting sets the agenda of a meeting. All right, we know that from jury research. When a jury is first sequestered, the first person who speaks, doesn't matter what they say, where are the toilets? When are the sandwiches coming? Doesn't matter what they say, <laughs> the first person who speaks is overwhelmingly voted jury foreman, overwhelmingly. So your traffic cop has to be a little smarter than that. You know, um, I see some names on here, so I'm just going to call them out. Let's hear from Ivy first today. You know, let's hear from Joy first today. You know, hold on, Lisa. You know, let's hear from Stephen first today. Hold on, Charity. You know, so we mix it up. You know, so that's another sort of refinement to this traffic cop. Yeah, and it's a tool. It's a tool. And you do that, incidentally, on, on Zoom calls, and you do it on conference calls. You know, you'll hear some manager go on a conference call or even a Zoom call. Anybody got anything to say? <laughs> nothing. You get nothing. But I'll bet you if I called and I said, so, Ivy, what do you think of this particular thing? Ivy's going to have something to say. And it's going to be a major contribution to the, the, com the conversation. You know? So, you know, th that is a simple tool. Those are simple tools. Then there are things, and incidentally, in a meeting, there's an, another kind of tool that you can have. Uh, which is you can put in an independent evaluator in a meeting periodically. And what they're evaluating, they're not part of the group, and they're not taking names and numbers in that sense. And they're not taking people's names, but they're, they're, they're cataloging who talks, how long, long they talk, who interrupts whom, the frequency of interruption, right? and who takes other people's ideas. And they just literally do a stroke count with that. You know, you don't have to have people's names attached to it, right? You do have to usually, gener you have to have gender attached to it because that's gonna be very descriptive for you and potentially other historically underrepresented group, you know, monitoring. And then you go to the manager who incidentally, if you said to the manager, did everyone talk in this meeting? Sure, everyone talked in the meeting. Anybody talk longer than anybody else? No, not particularly. Anybody interrupt anybody at all? Eh, I didn't hear anything like that. And then the independent evaluator says, well, actually, you know, five people talked 80 percent of the time. Four people interrupted six people. Yeah. You know, you know and, and managers, I'm going to give good faith to managers, are going to say, wow, I didn't see that. I never realized it. You know, now I better be more aware of the dynamic that's going on in that. So that's a tool. That's yep. a simple tool. Kind of thing. And there are plenty of others we can talk about. I mean, you were mentioning a little bit, you alluded to the fact that some people are quite good at stating their accomplishments. Yeah. And that's often Western cultures, et cetera. 
They're good at stating their accomplishments. You know, I did this, I did that, I did you know, whatever kind of thing. You know, because they do it because they want to get a promotion. They want to be seen as valuable. They want, you know, and they, and their culture has, has absolutely said that's okay. But some people have been taught, be, hum be humble. Don't toot your own horn, you know. Or they'll say things like, well, you know, my work speaks for itself. Well, P.S., your work doesn't speak. But, you know, my work speaks for itself, you know, or I'm going to put my head down, work hard, and all will be well, you know, because my manager should know what I'm doing, which is delusional, incidentally, you know, so, yep. so, but then you have the manager who might be a little bit, or supervisors, I mean, might be a little bit um, uh, oblivious that one person's sharing a lot and one person's not, and then again, They've got an assignment to give or they've got you know a promotion to give or a special training to give and they go well i remember that joe told me he was doing this 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 and this you know and lisa i don't even know what lisa's doing yeah and you incidentally are stating your accomplishments because you sharpened your pencil well right <laughs> and lisa has done huge projects very <laughs> successfully and very professionally right and you make the wrong decision based on how grandma taught you you know mm. so i would say well you know as a manager you better figure out a way to hear everyone's accomplishments you know on an ongoing basis so you're going to reach out to people like you know, i'm using lisa you're going to reach out to lisa and say so what have you been working on tell catch catch me up to date on things first you got to be aware this dynamic is going on and then you have to set up a system for doing that kind of thing that's another tool it's yeah. another tool so, I mean, we can talk some more about others as we go along. I think that the underlying point, the thing that we want to double and triple underline here is when you are leading heterogeneous teams, and most of them are today heterogeneous, they're not homogeneous anymore. When you're leading heterogeneous teams, you need to have another toolkit set, tools that you don't need when everybody is operating from the same belief system and from the same philosophies. And that holds true for corporate leaders who probably need training in order to be able to do that effectively and to add that to their toolkit. And it also goes for people who lead employee resource groups, because again, these teams, while on the surface may appear to be homogeneous because they're focused on one social element, in reality, they also are somewhat heterogeneous because there are people in there who come from different life experiences and walks of life who bring that mindset with them. So I think that's the one thing that I really want to underline from all the wonderful ideas that you just shared. So based on what we just learned from Laura, what are some ideas I heard that will make you a better, more inclusive ERG leader? One, recognize that diversity within your ERG goes beyond just one social element you share within your group. People who share a social component, such as race, gender, or ethnicity, still have diverse perspectives from each other based on their individual lived experiences. Find those, embrace them, and leverage all of this diversity in your group. Two, pay attention to the cultural differences in the way people present themselves. Some individuals may not naturally self-promote their accomplishments, while others do so easily. As a group leader, seek out, recognize, and acknowledge everyone's contributions. Three, likewise, not everyone participates in meetings in the same way. Some people take charge of discussions. Others are easily interrupted or won't say anything unless called. And still others hate to speak unless they feel 100% prepared with the perfect comment. So to get everyone to participate in meetings, you as the leader need to act as a traffic cop, moderating discussions to prevent interruptions and ensuring quieter individuals are heard. You may also want to rotate the order of who you call first to speak in order to provide an equitable platform for everyone. Four, 
to help you get an objective sense of your current meeting dynamics, bring someone to your meeting and ask them to play the role of independent evaluator. This person's job is to sit in on the meeting and objectively track who talks, how long they speak, who interrupts whom, and who takes over other people's ideas. This data can reveal imbalances and help you in addressing them. And finally, five, armed with data from the independent evaluator, put together a plan in advance to promote inclusivity in your meetings. For example, start your meetings with a published agenda and request that everyone prepare to participate in advance. Also, plan to start the meeting with a clear set of rules of conduct in terms of how people respect and listen to each other. And then set a pattern for participation. For example, you might say that everyone can comment on a particular topic for 60 seconds or less and make only one comment so that they don't eat up all the ideas and leave nothing for the other participants. This kind of preparation before meetings can ensure that every member is given equal opportunities to shine and contribute. When we come back, we will continue to delve into how you can use what we've learned from Laura to increase the value of your ERG by including and leveraging all your members and how this can produce value that you can then give to your entire organization. All that and more when we come back. But first, this. I'll see you on the other side. Are you an ERG group or committee chair struggling to balance your ERG activities with your day job responsibilities? Well, you're not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of passionate ERG leads all around the world that find themselves in the same boat. The only solution found by many is to give up lunch hours and personal time with family and friends. But there is a better way. And that better way is to master the powerful skills that enable you to one set realistic and achievable compelling goals and priorities Two, distribute the workload by effectively delegating tasks and responsibilities to others three communicate in a way that increases your impact with less time and effort on your part four Secure the full and active support of executive sponsors and other senior business leaders. And five, fit your ERG leadership work into a reasonable set of time boundaries. And that and more is exactly what tens of thousands of your colleagues have learned to do effortlessly by participating in Supercharge Workshops. Supercharge Workshops was developed by us along the same easy and powerful how-to framework found in our popular Supercharge Your ERG's book. The modular, customizable programs are loaded with fun exercises and tools that will immediately give you back hours of time each day while increasing your ability to achieve high impact and measurable results in both your ERG work and your job. For more details on how you can schedule a Supercharge Workshop session in your organization, go to superchargeworkshops.com. That's H-T-T-P-S colon forward slash forward slash supercharge workshops one word with no spaces dot com so don't suffer silently take that first step towards stopping your struggle today check out supercharge workshops One of the things I wanted you to talk about now is the elephant and the mouse. I heard you relate that story in one of these other interviews that you did. You talked about the elephant and the mouse and what that means about power dynamics. And that reveals even another layer here that we all have to be aware of when we're dealing with people, whether it's at a corporate level leadership or at an ERG level leadership. Sure, absolutely. And incidentally, with reference to what you're talking about, that this applies to ERGs, applies to any group, any group dynamic that has a heterogeneity to it. You know, Scott Page has got a wonderful phrase. Uh, He says, a group of smart people does not make a group smart because you need tools to get that from a heterogeneous group. So the elephant and the mouse um, comes basically from the notion that if you are the elephant in the room, i.e. dominant group, what is it that you really think you need to know about the mouse? Non-dominant group. Not much. You're this giant elephant, the little mouse. Not much. How much? 
If you're the mouse in the room, what do you need to know about the elephant? Everything. Everything. The non-dominant group needs to know everything about the dominant group, right? And incidentally, this research came from the colonizer and the colonized. If you were the colonizer, you didn't know much about the colonized. If you were the colonized, you knew everything about the colonizer. Okay? So if you're in this power position, you don't, you don't, you may, you may not even have an awareness of others, you know, who aren't in your power position, you know. And some of the traits, incidentally, of the dominant group, I think, are actually good as the elephant. You kind of go where you want. You're not really worried about what anybody else has to say about things, you know. And some of that's not necessarily bad to have in your toolbox of things. But the non-dominant group, far more empathetic far more aware, far more, you know, I mean, they, we often talk about women's intuition. You know what women's intuition is? Hypervigilance of the non-dominant group. That's what women's intuition is. They've just been so hypervigilant to the dominant group, they picked up, oh, well, you know, in the elephant mouse notion, the, ele the mouse is going, well, the elephant just did, twitched its, its, its left ear. Oh, that means it's hungry, you know. The elephant just twitched its, its trunk. Oh, that means it's moving forward. You know, do you think the, do you think the elephant knows what you know when the mouse twitches its whiskers means? Nah, it doesn't. You know. So what I'm saying now, and this is where I think ERGs can play a very important role, and one that I didn't quite hear in that list of things, which is the dominant group doesn't generally understand the lived experiences of the non-dominant group, right? Non-dominant groups, are they pretty well know the lived experiences of the dominant group. I mean, if you even ask people, why do you code switch? Well, that's about, you know, being a non-dominant member trying to fit to the dominant group's approach to things, right? That's part of what that's about. Um, and I, I pick this up, the, the concept really from a man named T.D. Jakes. Now, some people will know who T.D. Jakes is, right? extraordinary bishop, pastor, huge congregation in Texas, uh, playwright, philosopher, friend of Oprah, you know, kind of thing, uh, African-American man. And he said to me, an African-American man with a GED knows more about a white man than a white man with a PhD knows about an African-American man. That's where I picked this up. Now, what I'm saying now that leaders need different, better tools one of the things that leaders should be using the ERGs for is getting a collective voice about what the lived experiences of that group are within the organization. That ERG should be a conduit to the leadership to, to voice in a collective way, because sometimes it's hard to voice singularly as an individual, you know. It, but to say, you know, look, we, we feel like the standard by which we're measured is different than the standard by which other people are measured. We feel an isolation. You referenced that kind of thing. We feel like, you know, we have to, we have to be much better than average. We feel like that the personnel evaluation system isn't working well. You know, so, so that it can help the organization with its heterogeneity. You know, one of the things that I always like to see with the ERGs is is there someone in the senior leadership who is not of that group of that ERG, right? So let's say it's a man for a woman's group who is not a sponsor necessarily, but kind of a, you know, I don't know what you want to call it. Someone who just is aligned with that group, meets with that group on an ongoing basis. And what they're doing, the ERG, is informing that person about what's going on within the organization. And I think that today, in today's world of heterogeneity, it's not going to work anymore for, for leadership to not know what's actually going on and the lived experiences within their organization. Because dominant groups think, well, the world works for you the way the world works for me. And we know that's not true. Yeah. So for, the example I often give, Joe, is what I call the possibility frequency example. All right, what's that? Okay, uh, I happen to live right now in the, in the DC area. I can go out and go hail a cab, go hail a cab, right? 
entirely possible that cab driver is going to go right past me and not pick me up. Entirely possible. It's happened to me, right? Okay. I'm a man of African descent. I'm a man of South Asian descent. I'm a man of Hispanic Latino descent. I go to hail a cab. How often does the cab driver go past him? Well, actually, one of the television stations did a sting. White man hailing a cab, black man hailing a cab. Five times more frequently. Five times more frequently. So if I say to that man, South Asian man, or that black man, or the Hispanic man, oh, come on, that's happened to me. Has so you had the exact same set of experiences? Not even close. Or another example, or this one. I get randomly, white woman, I get randomly searched at the airport. I'm sure people have had that experience, getting randomly searched at the airport. Sure, it's an algorithm. Fine. My name is Mohammed. How often do I get randomly searched at the airport? <laughs> Ask any Mohammed, and he's going to tell you 99.9. Right? But here's the thing, Joe. If I say, come on, Mohammed, that's happened to me. What are you making such a big deal of it? Or, well, you know, why are you kicking up a fuss here? It's happened to me. As if we've had the same lived experiences, not even close, not even close. Yeah, I have to say, I am a thousand percent with you on that point that you made earlier, too, about the ERGs. That is the most valuable thing that an organization can get out of an ERG. It is the most valuable thing that an ERG group can give the organization because the organization is blindly going along with, let's come up with this policy because it works for everyone, right? And then suddenly you have people that are exiting the company or they are totally turned off by the company. And, and the leadership is oblivious as to why that's happening. And guess what? The marketplace is evolving into this heterogeneous group also. So the same disconnect that the leadership is having with their employees, they're having that with their markets, especially if they're in the consumer business. And so by listening to these groups, they can get a lot of value. And these groups, the greatest gift that they can give is their perspective. Giving their perspective to their organization should be viewed as a gift. I mean, it is the biggest gift that an ERG can give a company. Forget about celebrating different months and whatever. That's fine. That's good. And there's some value to that. But the biggest gift is let's share what our lived experience is, as you said, in this company, so that the company better understands and has a more realistic view. Of course, that's a two-way street. The ERG has to move toward the sharing, and the organization has to move toward the receiving of that gift. But that is one of the most powerful things, and I didn't see it on any of the lists that I researched when I put my list together that I talked about earlier. So, let me ask you this, Laura, what are some ways that the ERG groups themselves within their communities can help their communities to be more effective in navigating within this structure that's literally not built for them, not built for most of the members of these various communities? Uh, what are some of the things that they can do that might help members themselves? Yeah, I do want to add another thing to the, this you know, list of, that you put together, uh, and you're referencing it also, which is, is that uh, ERGs can also be actually a, a very significant part of customer and client development, right? So there's actually an economic value to the company for ERGs, you know, if used well, if done well. Yeah, because they're living wherever they're living. They have, you know, their 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 families, and they, they know companies that you, you know the senior leadership or the marketing teams may not have any knowledge of. You know, they they they'll, they'll know um, popular uh, actors or actresses or singers or what's being appealed to in a way that your the the particular marketing teams usually don't. You know, or sales teams usually don't. No, and so it's not that I'm saying that ERG should be the sole purpose of you know client development and customer development, but they are a conduit for information that a smart company taps into and learns from. You know, so I, I just want to sort of you've already said it, but I just wanted to articulate that some more um, because I think it's it's it makes for good business sense also. 
because they're, you know, I mean, all you have to do is look at the, the, the sales and marketing of specific foods and things like that, and clothing and cars, it's a, a, any one of a number of things, you know, that are segmented by groups, you know, and how these, these particular things are growing tremendously. Well, you know, you could miss out on that entirely if you don't, if you don't really understand how that market works. So anyway, I just want to put that out there. You know, I think part of what a, a good ERG can do, every organization has unwritten rules. Every organization has unwritten rules. You know, and often those unwritten rules are passed on to people who look like you, right? So a senior leader finds someone that looks like them. Oh, you remind me of me when I was young. You know, let me help you along here. Let me give you some of the unwritten rules situation. You know, for example, never go in to talk to a senior leader without your coat on or without, you know, your jacket on. I don't know. Something as simple as that. You know, make sure that you always say hello to, you know, to this this person or that person. It could be any one of a number. Of it. Make sure that your slide presentations have no more than 20 words on them. It, it, you know, people, people, when they get those unwritten, unwritten rules, they, they get a shortcut to success. If they don't get those unwritten rules, because you don't remind me of me when I was young, so I, I won't even think to tell you these kinds of things, you know, then you have to plod through making the mistakes and learning from your mistakes. And we also know for historically underrepresented groups, it's much harder to overcome the mistakes you make. You know, see, because people are going, a lot of people are doing confirmation bias. I hate to say it, but they, they're saying, well, you know, we did hire this group of people or this, you know, but well, I'm not so sure. And then somebody makes a mistake and they go, ah, see, told you, told you, you know, whereas, you know, the person from the dominant group can make two, three, four, a half a dozen mistakes. They're going, oh, you know, they're just youthful. They're just finding their path, you know, yeah. So you can see what then starts to happen. So it's handing, handing on the unwritten rules, I think, is essential. Uh, and an ERG grouping can do that kind of thing. Um, clearly, if you have some senior leaders uh, within the ERG, or even just leaders within it, uh, doing both mentoring and sponsoring, you know, uh, we know Herminia Barra's work out of INSEAD has found that women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. And we know the difference between mentoring and sponsoring, right? Mentoring is fine. We all kind of need it, but it's sponsoring that's going to really get you, get you ahead. So being able to do that, being able to be an advocate for someone, you know, who might not get onto the radar in a way that they should be getting onto it. Um, you know, encouraging others to be allies to the group. One, one of the things that I think, particularly in this, in this uh, political climate, I, I absolutely believe that ERG should have a good mission statement, but they should all say, and all employees of X company are welcome to participate and join this ERG, right? Because you need that kind of allyship stuff going on. So I think that that's a really important element of what ERGs can do, you know, and be the sounding boards, obviously, um, when people have it. And, you know, I mean, I, I remember one fellow, he was telling me that he, he learned this from um, someone in the ERG he was in, um, was a black, young black man, and they had casual Fridays. And this was when people were actually working at the office. They had casual Fridays. And this other gentleman said to him, look at never wear jeans on casual Friday. Now, White guys were all wearing jeans on casual Fridays. He said, wear pressed khakis. But, you know, that, that would be the minimum. Wear pressed khakis. You're a young black man. You know, because there's going to be archetypes about who you are. You know, and you don't want to feed into those archetypes. Now, is that fair? No, it's not fair. You know, is it reality? Unfortunately, it is. But it's that kind of thing that can have, you know, it seems small, can have a really big impact on people and their careers. You know, and partly, you know, I'll tell you, I, I'm always reluctant to, to tell people they should do style compliance. You know, they should absolutely, you know, remove their own authenticity and start mimicking the dominant group, because that's just not fair. 
And it's not helpful and it's very tiring to do. Okay. On the other hand, I think it's wise to understand what the processes are in within the organization, what those unwritten rules are, and see, see how you want to take those in for yourself and see how others have adapted themselves in ways. But style compliance itself is really exhausting, really exhausting. Those are all great pieces of advice. And there was one thing that you were talking about now in terms of the groups becoming more open to more diversity within themselves that I've often talked about as well. And I think that one of the groups that did one of the best jobs of that early on was the LGBTQ community because it was LGBTQ plus. And I think that plus, as it's just a little symbol at the very end, but it says a lot. And so a lot of times when I talk to women's groups and others, and they'll say, well, you know what, you know, we don't really have any men joining us. I said, well, maybe, just maybe the title women's leadership group or women's information network or whatever it is that the title of the group is, maybe some people take that to mean only women are being invited to be part of this. I would take a page out of the LGBTQ group manual and just say, put a plus at the end of that, right? Like advertise that the door is open and that basically you're focusing on this social dimension, but not only women need to come to focus on that social dimension, it could be focused on by other people as well. And then you can design your meetings as you want so that some are maybe more focused to that social dimension and others are broader, but there's so much that you can do to bring in a broader group. And I think that just... Having people then come in who bring these different dimensions of of thought into your group, that not only provides the opportunity for, as you mentioned before, sponsorships in addition to to mentorships, because people tend to sponsor people that they know. Obviously, you're putting some of your social capital on the line for some when you want to make sure that there's somebody that you can back and that you know. Not only does that provide that opportunity, but it also provides the opportunity to have that valuable exchange and learning about the values you have and the values another person has. And in that exchange, you begin to realize where your commonalities and your differences are and how you can work best together. So I think that that's just one of the things that groups can do that will help all their members is open those doors a little bit wider. So my last question for you is a two-part question, right? What are some resources that you recommend that people can go out there and get to learn more about this stuff? In addition to going out to Amazon and getting your two books, which I personally recommend because I found them very insightful. And I'm sure that anybody who listened to this discussion found that there's uh, a lot of insight. You just mentioned like a few slivers of some of that insight in some of your comments. So what are some additional resources and how can people reach you who want to reach out to you directly? Sure. Well, thank you for both of those questions. Uh, For the last one, you know, I do have a website and there's a place in there to submit contact or whatever. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. And so people requesting to be LinkedIn. Great. Um, You know, in terms of resources, one of the things that I think is really important is to keep an eye out on the sort of evolving research that's going on Um, and and then taking that research back to your organization and saying, for example, is this happening to us? So there are various places you can get your research from, you know, and any particular ERG knows some particular focus um, uh, opportunities and subject matter expertise. Uh, You know, Harvard Business Review has lots of good stuff. So if your organization has a, you know, has a subscription to it that yeah, you ask you at least from the ERG's perspective, can we get them onto that? Um, so just keeping your eye out on all of those kinds of things. But then importantly, this is where another role the ERG comes in. For example, lots of research that shows that uh, in fact, about 75% of senior executive uh, women in their performance reviews have some comment about their personal communication style too aggressive, too assertive, sharp elbows, yeah, 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 okay? 2% of senior executive men's performance reviews have some comment about their communication style, 
Okay, so what does that tell you? Either you're hiring women, only women who have sharp elbows, or you've got a performance <laughs> review process problem, right? So if you know that's that data point, if you know those statistics, the ERG takes that to the human capital group or whatever it is and says, is this happening with our performance reviews? We wanna see what the data show around this within our organization. Now they can hide data in certain ways and you know, filter it out to make sure that nobody gets identified particularly, but that kind of knowledge is really important uh, for an organization to move ahead. So one of the things I think ERG should do, could do, is, is keep that you know, information flowing to organizations. And you get that from a myriad of sources that, that you know, there's a lot of research now going on around this. So one of the reasons the LGBTQ plus that have done that as a plus is because they know the research that if you know someone who's gay or lesbian or LGBTQ, then you're more likely to be accepting of people. Mm -hmm. So you know that research. So then one of the things you do is you bring people in so they get to know people. Okay. So it makes perfect research-based uh, sense. So that, that's kind of, a, it's kind of an umbrella answer to your question. Yeah, that's excellent, because I think that is important to look at those things that are going on out there. And there's, as you said, there's plenty of articles and research. I share a lot of articles that I come across with members of my association. And some of those articles present conditions in other companies or things that organizations have picked up across a, a large group of companies. And that's a great question to ask. Is that happening here? And how can we address it here? Because by addressing every one of those little issues, bit by bit, we're getting better and better, as opposed to only utilizing these groups to basically say, oh, look how wonderful we already are. I think that that is a much better use in the long run. Laura, Thanks again for joining us today on ERG Power Talk. I wish we could just go on and on. This has been an insightful conversation, and I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. Well, thank you for hosting me, and, and thank you very much for what you're doing. I think the kind of effort that you're making to get that information out there, to hear from different people, is really essential. So I'm going to just tell you, thank you. Okay, so what did we get out of this final segment of our discussion with our guest, Laura Liswood? One, always be aware of the power dynamics within your groups. Remember, dominant and non-dominant personalities always show up whenever people gather together. And like the analogy of the elephant and the mouse in Laura's book, dominant people often do not understand the experiences of non-dominant people. As a group leader, you may actually be in the dominant category within your ERG and thus unaware of the needs of the less dominant people in your community group. So you need to be consciously aware of that condition so that you can work to bridge the gap. Two, regarding the benefits that ERG leaders and their groups can provide to the rest of the organization, none is more precious than the voices and perspectives of all your members. Well-run ERG meetings so that all the members' perspectives are heard and collected can be used to provide leaders of the organization with priceless insights into the views of your entire community. So it's important to encourage all your members to communicate how they experience the company and then pass this information collectively up to leadership through your office of DEI. This is especially valuable when your ERG members give feedback on their positive or negative experiences with your company's unspoken rules for success. These rules include things like FaceTime with managers or how people present themselves and how they're perceived to either have leadership qualities or not based on how they present themselves. Three, you should work with the Office of DEI to establish tools and methods for collecting and conveying your members' insights to senior leaders. In addition to helping these business leaders understand the thinking of the communities that make up their workforce, these perspectives can also help them understand new, diverse, emerging markets. 
four, in addition to creating a formal structure for collecting and conveying the diverse perspectives and insights of your group members through the Office of DEI to your senior leadership, another helpful way to do this is to invite senior leaders to participate as members in your ERG meetings. And I don't mean as a sponsor, observing ally, or to share a presentation about the business, but as a full member of the group. And finally, five, to open your doors to create an even more diverse membership, encourage the full participation of all employees, including those from dominant groups in your company. While the purpose of your ERG might be to promote and leverage, say, women in the organization, anyone from any walk of life in the organization can be invited to join in. This promotes more bilateral allyship and a deeper understanding of each other. Some of you may wonder why you, as leaders of groups comprised primarily of non-dominant group people, are getting all this advice on promoting more inclusion in your ERGs. To answer that question, let me share a short story from the Bible with you. During a segment of what is known as Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount to a large crowd, he asked, and I paraphrase, How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is this big plank lodged in your own eye? He then goes on to advise, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. As proponents of inclusion to the entire organization, it's vital that you first identify opportunities to demonstrate and live the inclusion you seek in others in your groups. Whether it's a Black, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, women, LGBTQ group, or any other group, you'll find that people sort themselves into their own dominant and non-dominant groupings. It's clear, therefore, that to drive inclusion throughout your organization effectively, you need to first establish inclusiveness within your community and then leverage what you learn from that entire community to provide honest feedback and input on what is needed to make your organization writ large more equitable and inclusive of your community and other communities. Do this across every one of your ERGs and you will begin to spread the spirit of equity and inclusion across your entire organization. So I urge you to start today to demonstrate and communicate the equitable and inclusive change you want to see in the rest of the organization so that you and your fellow ERG members can shine out as a beacon of light to the rest of your company. Thank you for tuning in to ERG Power Talk. If you enjoyed and got value out of this program, please like us and leave a favorable review at your podcast provider site. Also, invite others to listen to the show. By the way, contact me if you're looking for an ERG symposium keynote or a leader for your strategy workshop, new chair onboarding, and or ERG bootcamp. I can run these for you either in person or in a virtual setting. Also, for more great ideas and tips for your ERGs, get my books, Supercharge Your ERGs, 18 Tips to Power Up Your ERG slash BRG Strategy, and the new DEI and ERG Frontier, how you and your efforts can rise and thrive in the new world of constant disruption. Both available on Amazon.com. I'm Joe Santana. Thanks again for tuning in.